It's our privilege to have with us tonight Waleed Shubat, who comes from the heritage of a grandfather who was a, a Muslim chieftain. Matter of fact, his great-grandfather was also a fighter, and that heritage continued on throughout the family. As a young man, he was a member of the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and he participated himself in acts of terror and violence against Israel. He was later in prison in the Russian compound, which uh, was Jerusalem's central prison uh, for incitement and violence against Israel. After his release, Walid continued his life of violence and rioting in Bethlehem and the Temple, Temple Mount. And after entering the United States, he worked as a counselor for the Arab Student Organization uh, based in Chicago at a college there, and he continued his anti-Israeli uh, and anti-Israel activities even in that position. But it was in 1993 that Walid had studied the Jewish Bible and a, a challenge to convert his wife to Islam. And after a number of months of intense study, he realized that everything he had been taught about Jews was a lie. His eyes were opened to the truth of Christianity. Walid is an American citizen. He lives here in the United States. He's authored numerous books, of which we uh, mentioned here earlier, uh, and on the back table here. Uh, he's been in high demand, appearing on national television and uh, news shows all over the world and here across the United States, uh, even within the last uh, 24 to 36 hours. Let's give a warm welcome tonight to Waleed Shubai. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you. I don't know why it gets so uncomfortable for me when I see a thousand or more people. <laughs> but I should not be scared because they are my fellow countrymen and people who would love me and support me. I don't even know why I carry notes with me. I rarely ever use them. <laughs> it's like a baby blanket. Everyone has to have one, so I'll spread these things round about like this, and it'll take me half hour to warm up. <laughs> Brother Vic told me that President Reagan spoke here. There's one favorite line I like that President Reagan said, that one of somebody in the crowd stood up and said, Hail Reagan. Remember that scene? Hail Reagan. Treat him as a Nazi. And he responded, and he said, Ah, shut up. If it wasn't for my generation, you'd be saying hail to someone else. <laughs> they can say that the Bible is corrupt, but we can't say the Quran is corrupt. Everyone can say that Christianity is a violent religion and the Bible is filled with violence. Yet none of us can say that Islam is violent. We must say that Islam is a peaceful religion, and that's what they tell me. You better say Islam is a peaceful religion, or we will kill you. <laughs> the peaceful religion, my friends, is the one that when people curse at it, its followers pray for you. Christianity, my friend, is the peaceful religion. Amen. But I learned all my life as a child that the Bible has been corrupted. I grew up as a Muslim. The Bible has been changed. Who changed the Bible? Of course, the Jews changed the Bible. The Jews changed the Old Testament. The Christians changed the New Testament. In fact, virtually all Muslims believe the Bible has been corrupt. Finally, I learned, when I read the Bible in 1993, that indeed the Bible was corrupted. But before you throw tomatoes at me and crucify me, hear me out. The Islamic religion took apocryphon, apocryph pieces from the apocrypha, pieces from the Bible, added its own ideology into the text, and created a new text which was the corruption of the Bible. The Qur'an is a corruption of the Bible. The corruptors accused the innocent of corruption. The haters accuse the ones who love with hate. They make the weddings, funerals, 
and they make the funerals weddings, everything is upside down, confusing to the whole world, and the whole world must kowtow and bow down to it and say that Islam is a peaceful religion. I once remember a little incident when I was a teenager in high school. I was going to school that day in Bethlehem. My school was next to a place that is a memorial for the Jews called Rachel's Tomb. I never knew who Rachel was, neither did my Muslim teachers teach me who Rachel was, and every day I stand by the bus stop right there, look behind me, Rachel's Tomb. Who was Rachel? Nobody said anything about Rachel. It was a place for the Jews. One time I was walking around about there, and a construction truck with a yellow license plate, which means it's an Israeli construction truck, accidentally struck a girl. And as he tried to call for help, he had a wireless in the truck, he tried to call for help to help the girl. And as soon as we saw the situation, we instantly carried rocks and began to stone the truck. As the guy was bleeding from his forehead, he's still calling for help for the girl. He finally realized that a crowd of a hundred or so students surrounding the truck could be very detrimental for his health. He made a U-turn and got out of Dodge. We went back to school, of course, and the school body got together. We had a thousand students in our school, just the same number as here. And we're trying to decide what to make up of this incident. And a blind student, blind since birth, rose his cane in the sky, and he says, by Allah, he struck that girl intentionally. The Jews want to kill Palestinians. This was done intentionally. And the entire school erupted in a riot in which they had to get riot control, you know, tear gas, and it was, there was some broken bones. It was a pretty bad situation. It took me years to rethink this scenario. It was only 1993 when I began to read the Bible and I began to review my entire life. I asked myself a question. I said, that incident, that man was blind. How could he testify to an incident he could have never seen? But that's not the erroneous part of the story. The crazy part of the story is that how could a thousand students follow him? Blind leading the blind is very usual in the Middle East. This is why I always like to say that uh, the element of what's missing in our culture is critical thinking. I didn't learn critical thinking those days, of course. Only in 1993, I began to really think in a critical fashion. In 1991, I took a trip to the Middle East. I went back home. And as I started with my uncle on this trip, he was driving me uh, in the cities of Ramallah, Nablus, uh, Bethlehem, all over the place. I saw graffiti all over the walls. Now, my mind is not used to the graffiti that I grew up with all my life. I lived in America for a few years, and I asked my uncle, I said, Uncle, why do we have so much graffiti in our town and in all the other towns? I couldn't find a square meter that didn't have graffiti, either whitewashed graffiti or fresh graffiti. What did the graffiti say? That the most famous graffiti that permeated the Palestinian streets was Naqra'u Abwab al-Jannah bi jamajim al-Yahud. We knock on the gates of heaven with the skulls of Jews. Uncle, is there a different way to go to heaven besides knocking on the gates of heaven with the skulls of them Jews? You ask too many questions. That trip, coming back from America, developed critical thinking. I was criticized all the time that I asked too many questions. The Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, said, Allah hated too many questions. Then I took another trip to Hebron. I took a taxi cab in Hebron, a Mercedes taxi cab. And by the, when it reached to downtown Hebron, I witnessed something that began to make me think. There was a community of Jews that took a bus, a public bus, the Kiryat Arba community. And every time they get into that bus, Palestinians gathered together and began to hail stones at the bus. You could barely see the bus, had wire mesh, bulletproof glass, and 
You could barely see the people in the bus because of the rocks like locusts. Of course, the taxi cab driver wanted to make a U-turn. I said, stop right here. I rolled down my window and I began to watch this incident. I, I began to talk to the taxi cab driver. I said, you know, why do we do this? Why do we stone this bus? He says, well, they're Jews. I says, well, so? Well, they shouldn't be here. I said, why not? Well, they're settlers. This is Palestinian land. I says, well, we have 1.2 million Palestinians living in Israel proper. They're in Jewish territory, in Israeli territory. No one stones their buses, and they worship towards Mecca five times a day. Nobody harasses them. You can take a prayer rug and go to Israel proper and pray in the street towards Mecca. Nobody harms you. Why can't these Jews live amongst us? I began to think, could it be racism? Could it be religious hatred? Could it be other things and besides the normal things that I was always taught that the reason we as Muslims used to riot and get angry, maybe it's because of occupation. I began to review myself and well, three-fourths of suicide bombing exist in Muslim countries that have no occupation. Could it be poverty? At one university, I remember speaking about the subject, and the professor stood up and he says, maybe, Walid, the reason we have terrorism is because there's poverty in the Muslim world. If we remove poverty, especially in the Palestinian areas, in Gaza, so on and so forth, perhaps we won't have any more suicide bombers. I says, well, you know, let me, let me ask the students, see what they think. So I remember seeing a student from India with a big turban, Sikh, and I wanted him to answer the question. So I said, well, is anybody here from India? And I acted like I wasn't looking at him. And as I turned around, and he's raising his hand all excited. I'm from India. I said to him, well, you know, do you have poverty in your country? He says, we got lots of poverty, Mr. Shubat, lots of poverty. You know that Indian accent? <laughs> I said, do you guys uh, have suicide bombing as a result of poverty? He says, Mr. Shubat, we got lots of poverty in India. We don't, we don't blow ourselves up. But however, they come from Pakistan and for some reason they blow us up. <laughs> Sometimes a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Even the Pope made a statement. He said, Islam must never be propagated through violence. Well, you know, if I talk to any pastor in this place, Christian pastor, say, hey, you know, we need a sermon. The title of the sermon should be, Christianity shall not be propagated through violence. They would love it. No problem. 